As the Medusa sailed from Rochefort in 1816, many aboard saw bright futures ahead for themselves. They were escaping a country torn asunder, harshly divided by war, revolution and eventual restoration. With the French Empire floundering and a band of hard-right ultra-royalists creating laws in France, the promise of a new start in a fresh land was enticing for many. Little did they expect to meet such a high degree of incompetency on their voyage. Had they foreseen even a fraction of the horrors that lay ahead for them, many might have chosen to stay in France, no matter the situation. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Dark Histories. I'm Ben, as always, this is Season 3, Episode 17. Today's episode, I thought we'd go a little bit more horror than we have been of late. I figure, you know, the nights are starting to roll in. I'm starting to get back into that kind of real horror kind of vibe. We've got October on the horizon. So yeah, I'm not sure if this would be horror for everyone. But for me particularly, I don't know. See, I'm not sure if this is really just sort of my own fears and phobias or whatever. But I, I, I mean, I was writing this and I was getting sweaty palms. This is an absolute horror show. Um, before we start, I do want to say thank you to the new patrons and obviously all the current patrons as well. Um, thank you for all your support. Newest patrons are Jeff, Barbara, David, Jason, Jessica, Lisa, Mari, Mary, Alan, and Leonel. I think it's Leonel. Fingers crossed that I pronounced that one right. Thank you very much for all your support. As always, uh, it's super appreciated. And I'm at a level of support now where during the next break in seasons, I'm going to be looking at hopefully making some changes um, to the production of the show. Nothing scary. It will all be good things um, just in terms of the sound quality and whatnot. So, yeah, that's all going to be thanks to everyone who supports really um, and has made that possible. So thank you very much. I, I really do appreciate that. I'll talk more about that as the time comes. Um, but for now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode is Death Raft, The Wreck of the Medusa. France in 1816 was a volatile place to be. The population was severely divided following the recent restoration of Versailles and the reinstatement of the French monarchy. Republicans were in a state of collective loss after Napoleon's defeat and exile and the country as a whole drew into a recovery period from the long-running battles which had devastated the country in the years prior. Just two years earlier, after war weariness and fatigue weighed heavily on a country that had been fighting around the globe for over 25 years, war veterans had returned to Paris en masse, leading to packed hospitals, extremely high levels of unemployment and homelessness, and bodies that piled up lining the Seine. In order to relieve the situation, asylums were emptied of their patients to create more bed space for the returning soldiers, and mass graves were dug for those less fortunate. Famine threatened the city, pillaging ran wild as a sense of complete societal breakdown teetered on the edge of becoming reality. There was change sweeping through France, however, after the failed attempt to invade Russia in 1812 had led to a backlash and a series of costly campaigns that had seen France herself invaded, culminating in the surrender and occupation of Paris by the Prussian and Allied forces. Following the French surrender in March of 1814, conditions in Paris slowly began to improve, but France was a population deeply divided between the Royalists, those loyal to the reinstated monarchy and King Louis XVIII, and the Republicans, those who had chosen to fight alongside Napoleon against both the Allied forces and many of their own countrymen. Napoleon was stripped of his powers as leader of the French Empire and sent into exile, and the king, in a weary attempt to unify the nation, spoke of healing and of a fusion between two peoples. This was shown to be truly wishful thinking in a stark way, when Napoleon headed an attack force that marched through France towards Paris with an army that consisted mainly of officers who had been sent to stop him. Napoleon's final defeat came at Waterloo. The monarchy, along with a fragile sense of stability, resumed once again, but the atmosphere had turned sour with the attempted invasion by Napoleon, and now ultra-royalists used the situation to instate a tough new regime upon the country. 
hard right laws were passed, oppression was the rule of the day, and Napoleonic sympathisers were turfed from official positions, assassinated or slaughtered. They were replaced by men who had remained loyal to the king during the times of the revolution, those that had chosen to flee and fight alongside the Allied forces against their own country. It was in this deeply torn atmosphere that the French Minister of the Navy planned for the completion of the British handover of a colonial outpost in Senegal. Originally a French colony, the British had taken control of the land during the Seven Year War in a plan to strangle international trade and weaken the French economy. Following the American Revolutionary War, the Treaty of Paris saw it handed back to French occupation. In order for the handover to transition smoothly, France was sending a convoy of four ships to Senegal that would include the French governor of Senegal to be, his administrators and other governing officers, two full companies of the African battalion and a whole host of colonialists who had been offered land for helping to rebuild the colony, ranging from explorers and geographical engineers to tradesmen, shopkeepers and clerks. In total, the four ships were to carry over 400 people to the colony, It was, for many, perhaps the promise of a fresh start in a land distant from the troubled atmosphere of the French mainland. The four ships of the convoy that were set to sail from Rochefort to Senegal in June of 1816 were a corvette named the Echo, a transport named the Loire, a brig named the Argus, and a frigate named the Medusa. The men chosen to captain and lead the ships were a reflection of the French situation. During the culling of revolutionary sympathisers from military positions, many had been replaced by royalists who were seen by some to have not entirely earned their position. Chiquel de Touche, the captain of the transport ship Loire, had served with the French Navy since he was 10 years old. A fierce republican, he had been imprisoned by the English for six years and fought at Trafalgar. At only 33 years old, he was already a weathered hand and found the situation most distasteful. Veterans of great wars are vegetating on half-pay in ports, while brilliant commissions are given to those whose only merit has been to remain faithful to the Bourbons. His outspoken feelings echoed throughout the convoy's leadership, where revolutionaries and royalists, men who had previously fought one another in battle, were now rolled together, sent to sea, and expected to get along. One man, who embodied the target of de Touche's attacks, was frigate captain Hugh de Roy de Chaumeray. During the revolution, he had fought as a lieutenant and was eventually exiled from France, where he fought with the English against the French revolutionaries. He took part in several campaigns, one of which ended in a massacre for the English and its allies, but Chaumeray had managed to slip away back to England to fight another day. Now he found his loyalty rewarded as he was named captain of the Medusa and in control of the entire convoy. The problem with this decision for everyone else was the small fact that he had not set foot aboard a ship in over 25 years and had never once commanded a single ship in his life. Naturally, he was seen by everyone below him as a vastly incompetent captain with not nearly enough experience for the expedition. Moreover, a seething bitterness bubbled under the surface. For many, he was not only incompetent, but also at political ends with their own views. He was a courageous gentleman, and not very serious-minded, and he seemed to find it natural that I would be his obedient servant. First, I made him understand that I was myself as true a gentleman as he was, and that I did not think that I had done wrong in serving my country during the time he had chosen to go into exile. Then he changed his attitude towards me. This was quite characteristic of him. Was it just a gentlemanly reflex, or did it show a basic lack of character? The latter, I think, for it seems that in spite of his show-off manner, de Chaumeray was easily manipulated, like all cocksure fellows. This clash of ideology was not only displayed between de Touche and de Chaumeray, the second in command of the Medusa, Joseph Raynor, was another Republican, whilst the captain of the Argus was a royalist. Amongst the soldiers on board, of which numbered 160, the divides continued. The ships were a microcosm of French society, and the tensions and divides that were as bitter as they were deep 
came as part and parcel of the deal. The Medusa itself was a large frigate which had previously been deployed as a warship during the Napoleonic Wars, with room on deck for 44 18-pound cannons. Being reasonably fast in the water, her main duties had centralised around scouting, letter-carrying and patrols. Now, however, she had been recommissioned following a refit as a transport ship and had had 30 of the original guns removed to make space for passengers. Also aboard the Medusa were five smaller vessels for landing, the captain's barge, the Senegal boat, a longboat, the pinnace, a small landing vessel and the governor's barge. As a warship, the Medusa was relatively spacious, but as a passenger ship, the limitations quickly became apparent and as people filed aboard in preparation to sail to Senegal, the deck quickly filled to capacity as people erected temporary cabins and pitched their beds on the hard wooden floor next to their luggage. It was not a great start for the convoy and chimed in to a feeling of lack of preparation that was growing around the boats and of which extended further than just the living quarters of the passengers. Those in command noted in journals of how late in the year it was that they were setting sail and of how the charts given to them for navigation were wholly outdated and next to useless for charting a safe passage along the West African coast. The captain of the Echo, Francois-Marie Cornet de Venancourt, wrote in his own journal as the expedition prepared to sail. For the record, we have already wasted too much time. We shall arrive in a season very much advanced. I shall be able to serve on that coast for only a short while. This will be inefficient especially in view of the unique nautical description with which I have been supplied by the Minister of Marine. As for the charts enclosed with the hydrographic Francais, they are so imperfect that it is hardly possible to use them. Further, the chronometer number 131 issued to me at Rochefort is decidedly erratic. However, with such poor means and in such an unsuitable season, I shall do my best. The charts they were given by the Ministry were originally published in the 1750s and were, by the time of sailing, thought to be based heavily on hearsay and almost entirely wrong. De Chaumeray was not the only man in power who had been out of the game for a quarter of a century. The head of the French Naval Ministry himself had also been retired for 25 years before taking the position. When the sea charts were handed over to the captains, they were invited by the Ministry to navigate with caution. Despite these difficult conditions, the convoy of four ships sailed from Rochefort on 17th June 1816, bound for West Africa and the Senegalese port of St. Louis. The ships were ordered to stay in tight convoy and to sail south along the coast of West Africa. It was a dangerous but more expedient journey than the safer route, which would see the ships first sailing out to deep sea and then turning south once they could be sure they would be clear of any sandbanks or reefs. Their late departure saw the threat of the storm season creep over the horizon, and so this direct route was finalised. For now, the storms were a world away, and the concern with the weather was instead the tropical heat that shone down onto the ships from a midsummer sun. As the four boats left French waters, they headed south towards the smouldering heat of the equator. Aboard the Medusa was Colonel Julian Schmaltz, his wife and daughter. Upon the handover of Senegal, Schmaltz was to become the French governor. He was not keen on the proposed idea by some of the captains to prolong their journey by heading out to deeper waters before turning south, and privately, he pushed de Chaumeray to stick to the coast as planned and to sail ahead as quick as they could. De Chaumeray, much inexperienced as he was, privately agreed. For him, the route along the coast came with a secondary benefit, that it was almost impossible for him to get lost, as his navigation would, for the most part, remain on autopilot as the ship followed down the coastline. Quickly, the convoy began to separate. The Medusa was a relatively fast ship, and it pulled away ahead of the Loire almost immediately. As the ships stretched further and further apart, the Loire and the Argus both took it upon themselves to alter their course out to sea. If they were to be left behind by the convoy, then they at least would choose their own route, 
and so they turned out into the safety of the deeper waters. The echo kept up with the Medusa at first, but as the ships pulled into sight of the African coast, it slipped out to sea under the cover of darkness, choosing also to take the less direct but infinitely safer route. The convoy was now entirely defunct, and the four ships were sailing completely independently of one another. The convoy breaking up was not a particularly large matter between the men aboard the Medusa. Things had been relatively plain sailing for the most part. There had been a man overboard incident which saw a teenage boy drowned, but otherwise things were largely okay. Causing far greater concern amongst the officers were whispers that the boat was slowly drifting drastically off course. The broken instruments and sketchy charts that were so heavily relied upon in Deshormeray's inexperience had sent them over six nautical miles off course already. As the boat sailed on, quiet rumblings began to slowly erupt around the officers, filtering down to the sailors. Daily, de Chaumere found himself being more and more isolated as huddles of men turned silent upon his approach. On the 26th, he told the crew that he estimated they would sight Madeira that morning. However, it wasn't spotted until sunset that evening. By now they were as much as 60 miles off course and it had become obvious to all who minded that their captain was as useful as the charts he was following. De Chaumeray was further undermined by his own inexperience when, as they passed Ponta de Sol, the Medusa was nearly beached as it was suddenly swept towards the land and it wasn't until the lieutenants insisted that they should take the ship further out to sea that their course was altered. As it turned out, De Chaumeray had more or less handed over full control of captaincy to a man named Richefort, and was, by this point, only captain by name. As rumours spread of their new covert leadership, the unrest only intensified, as Richefort was considered by most of the sailors to be another inexperienced blowhard. Rather than quell their concerns, they found they were only doubled, as they now saw two useless captains in charge of their fate. On the evening of June the 28th, they sailed into view of Tenerife and took the opportunity to dock in Santa Cruz to restock their provisions. They sailed into the bay under a dense sea mist, though without wanting to waste any time, they set back out to sea the same afternoon. As the Medusa sailed out of the Santa Cruz Bay, the summer sun beat down, baking the deck in a tropical heat. As the temperature on board rose, so too did the atmosphere become more tense. The sailors were now openly accusing Captain de Chaumeray of shameful behaviour as he handed over more and more control to Richefort, a move which was roundly denounced, stating that they would not obey a man who didn't have the temperament to command. The Medusa teetered on the edge of mutiny, and as de Chaumeray's only effort to handle the situation was to double down, ordering his subordinates to obey Richefort's commands, the air of mutiny hung heavy over the ship as the intensely hot wind blew out across the ocean from the nearby Sahara. Rather than choosing to hold an outright mutiny, the ship's crew instead decided to handle the situation in a move which would best suit themselves. Recognising the incompetence of both de Chaumeray and Richefort, they instead just made decisions alone, without consulting the captain and his appointed surrogate. More than once, the overnight watch found the ship sailing dangerously close to reefs and ordered the ship to change course, all the while telling nothing of the manoeuvres to de Chaumeray. At least this way, they could look out for themselves and the clueless captain would not have to know any different. As the Medusa continued south along the African coast, the dangers of the Arguin Bank came into play. A huge 1,200 square kilometre sandbank stretching out into the sea from the West African coast like a large shelf, the Arguin Bank reaches out to sea below the water, causing violent surf and shifting sands. Depths could rapidly decrease as sandbanks rose to the surface of the water, and beaching was a very real threat that would affect any ships that dared sail directly over it. In the early 1800s, navigating the bank was no small feat and was best thought to just give it a wide berth by sailing 60 miles out to sea to ensure sailing past it would not cause any danger. Soundings were regularly taken by lead and line, a heavy lead weight tied to a rope marked at intervals for a certain number of fathoms. 
the lead was tossed out to sea, allowing the depth to quickly be read simply by eyeing the mark that lay above the surface. Simply by employing these two primitive measures, one could safely pass by the Arguin bank with little problem. De Chaumere, however, chose to not do either. In an effort to dupe the captain, the night watch woke de Chaumere at 5am on July the 2nd to tell him that they had reached the point they needed to steer out to sea long before de Chaumere had decided to turn the ship under Richefort's advice. Successful in their deception, de Chaumere ordered the ships to sail out. However, Richefort overrode the order, telling the men that they need only to turn out to sea by 30 miles rather than 60. A dreaded realisation fell over the men that the captaincy was now no longer attached to de Chaumere at all. The officers challenged Richefort's order, but after de Chaumere had them quickly arrested, the rest kept quiet and were told by their puppet captain, We know our jobs, now get on with yours and rest calm. It was with a certain amount of resignation then that the crew steered 30 miles out to sea, half of the recommended distance to ensure safe passage of the Arguin Bank. That morning, as the crew caught fish in clear, shallow waters, they tried to put the fears of the sandbank out of mind, despite the evidence to the contrary that by now completely surrounded them. By lunchtime, the sounding returned a depth of only ten fathoms, and as de Chaumere finally ordered the ship to change course, a strong wind blew across the deck, shifting the boat and grounding it out on a large sandbank. The vessel creaked in the wind and the wood strained on the bank, its full weight resting upon the hull as the shallow water lapped tamely against the side of the boat. Firmly grounded, the Medusa pitched to one side on the sandbank of the Arguin. At first, the officers attempted to lose weight from the ship and weigh out the low tide, in the hopes that by jettisoning as much weight as possible, the high tide might be just enough to shift the boat back into the water. They shifted the cannons to counterbalance the tilt and tossed all the ship's powder overboard. As the tide rose the next morning, the ship shifted marginally in the shallow water, but it was not enough to push it afloat. Next, they attempted to use a kedge anchor, a secondary, smaller anchor from the ship's main anchor, by carrying it out to sea aboard the longboat dropping it at a distance from the boat that kept the rope taut and attempted to pivot the boat around. The result, however, ended in the snapping of the rope and the loss of the anchor. The Medusa was, by now, in a sorry state as it creaked and groaned in the wind. Water began leaking in through the damaged hull, which the engineers attempted to patch in anticipation of refloating the ship. A panic set in among the population of the ship, Colonel Schmaltz, who had already recognised the lack of respect towards de Chaumere, decided it was time to take control. He called for a council to be held where options could be discussed on where they should go next. The first option was an evacuation to the nearby shore aboard the smaller boats. They could ferry all the passengers to the shore in a series of trips, ensuring that the people on the shore were guarded from wild animals and the indigenous moors. The Moors was an umbrella term that the Europeans used for both the West African Arabic population and the indigenous black African tribes. As always with colonial expeditions, there was a suspicion and fear of the indigenous peoples that stemmed from superstition and sensationalist reports of previous encounters. Stories of barbarism, piracy and cannibalism rung heavy in the minds of the shipwrecked passengers. The second suggestion put forward at the council was to build a large raft from the wood of the Medusa that could hold everyone. The raft would then be towed to land by the five smaller boats, allowing everyone to arrive at the same time, ensuring their safety from whatever might await them on the foreign shores. The two plans were put to a vote, with the raft winning out. Design and construction of the raft began immediately and the precarious vessel was quickly completed. It sat in the water at 65 feet long and 22 feet wide and bobbed precariously below the waterline. A 15-inch high railing was constructed around the edge, insufficient to achieve much of anything at all. The night of the 3rd of June was a rowdy one, as the ship's sailors decided that it was high time to drink the ship's wine stores rather than leave them behind. 
Anarchy broke out aboard the ship as drunks staggered around, looting everything they could get their hands on. Men with clothes pulled from the passengers' luggage laughed, sang and brawled on the deck of the Medusa, their voices rising out over the sandbanks. By 3am on the same night, it was decided by the ship's engineers that water flooding in from the damaged hull was now enough to be a considerable danger for the ship, threatening to break it up under its own weight as it perched on the sand. The evacuation was ordered with haste, and though a list had already been written up which delegated people to each ship and to the raft, it was quickly discarded as every man took to save themselves. A blazing cacophony of drunken soldiers, sailors and officers piled onto the raft, which instantly began to sink. In order to remain buoyant, the raft's provisions were cast overboard as still more passengers piled onto the precarious platform. Naturally, the officers in charge on the Medusa took it upon themselves to secure their own boats. De Chaumeray boarded the well-stocked captain's barge while Schmaltz got aboard the governor's barge. Overstocked and undermanned, the five boats began towing the raft away from the sandbank before the evacuation had even been completed. This led to them leaving 17 men behind, stranded on the deck of the Medusa calling out to the passengers on the raft who stood waist deep in seawater on the partially sunken structure. As the five boats pulled taut on the ropes attached to the raft, they began to swing around, pitch and wane wildly, dangerously out of control. It soon became apparent that the plan had dangerously underestimated the weight of the raft, and so, one by one, the ropes attaching the ships to the rafts were cut as each ship's commander acted to save themselves. Within an hour of the evacuation, the raft bobbed dangerously alone in the ocean. There were 147 passengers aboard, with no oars, no sails, no sea charts or compass, and worse, the only rations that had survived the chaotic evacuation was a 25-pound sack of water-soaked soggy biscuits, six tubs of wine and two of water. The drunk sailors stared silently out to sea, sobered by the realisation that they were alone in the ocean, far from the shore and with no means to get any closer. The five smaller vessels, the longboat, the captain's barge, the Senegal barge, the pinnace and the governor's barge, sailed off, each carving their own path through the sea, south towards Senegal and the port of St. Louis. The longboat was the first to find trouble, as it was soon discovered that it was in poor state of repair and was slowly sinking. Sailing close to the shore, 57 of the passengers decided to take their chances on dry land. They disembarked clumsily, washing up on the beach at 9pm, 200 miles north of Senegal. Not everyone on the ship fancied the trek, and so they pushed out back to sea, feeling more confident of the vessel, with its load now significantly lightened. As the castaways gathered themselves on the shore, one of them wrote in his diary, All is well, the weather is good, and there is hope of saving our lives. The motley crew gathered tightly together and began their march across the desert with faint memories of man-eating tribes and fearsome wild beasts dancing through their minds. Back on the longboat, the crew soon sighted the other smaller craft from the Medusa, pulling up alongside them, They offered to take the excess passengers in trade for some water, explaining that they had just disembarked 57 on the shore and so they had plenty of room if anyone wanted to board. In a stunning example of both the epic trek that now lay ahead of the passengers that had gone ashore and the level of distrust that now hung across the expedition, none chose to take them up on the offer, assuming that they were lying and simply scheming in order to steal rations. The boats instead sailed on as rations grew tighter. On the morning of the 8th, both the Senegal boat and the long boat wound up beached on the shore and so they too began the trek, not anywhere near as far ahead of the first shore party as they would have liked. They now faced a vicious trek across the desert with no provisions, exhausted, starving and sucking on lead balls to keep their saliva moving. The group shuffled forward south towards Senegal. At first, they survived by digging small wells in the ground and drinking putrid water, or they ate random vegetation, 
some of which caused sickness. At night, they slept huddled in a group, with guards appointed to stand and keep watch for animals or moors. They woke early before sunrise and walked for days. Stragglers who fell behind were left as the members of the trek walked forwards like zombies, whilst others wandered off into the desert in a state of delirium. On the 10th, they came across a group of moors riding camels and were able to trade anything they had on their persons for goat's milk. The moors listened to their story and offered to guide them to St. Louis. With renewed vigour, and now with guides who were familiar with the environment, the men pressed forwards, and the next day they spied the Argus, a ship from the original convoy, out at sea. Signalling the boat and sending out their moor guide to meet the landing party, they traded information, telling them of their shipwreck. The Argus had reached Senegal several days prior, and was now out searching for the rest of the convoy after it missed its expected arrival date. They sent ashore cheese, wine, brandy and biscuits for the castaways who gorged themselves on the familiar fare. With new energy, they continued the trek, reaching St. Louis two days later at 4pm on July the 4th. Asking around, they found that they were the first arrivals from the Medusa. The original 57 put ashore had still not reached the outpost, nor had any members of the raft. The 57 of the initial shore party were in something of a pickle, starving, dehydrated and battling a diarrhoea and sickness issue that had come about after they had drunk water from a rotten pool of standing water. On the verge of death, the group had been captured by a gang of moors, who they eventually negotiated with, offering them payment upon arrival in St. Louis if they would guide them south. The moors agreed and the group were making some headway when a second group of moors showed up telling the survivors that they had no problem with them and that they should remain calm. At the same time, they slaughtered the group's guides before taking the confused party to their camp nearby. On the fourth day as half-prisoners, half-guests in the moor camp, they spied the Argus out at sea, but were unable to make any form of signal, leaving them with a profound feeling of despair as sickness drained them of any possible hope that they may have had left. Five days later, with almost no hope left, a man arrived at the camp calling himself Kearney. He was dressed in Arabic attire and he was riding a camel but spoke with a thick Irish accent. He handed over a letter to the party which they read as relief flooded over them. My dear Angus, the person who brings you this letter is an English officer whose large and generous soul exposes him to all the dangers and inconveniences of a trip towards the place where you disembarked. He knows the country, the language and customs perfectly. Follow his advice carefully. The rest of us aboard the longboat and those from the other boats arrived here yesterday. We found a most generous welcome. Our ills are already eased and we wait for the complete happiness that our reunion with you and those with you will bring. Your friend, Espio. With great fortune, the group had been met with a guide and further, he had brought with him provisions. They ate rice and regained a certain degree of strength before leaving the moor camp the next day, walking delirious through the burning heat until on the 7pm, July the 22nd, 16 days after they were put ashore, they arrived in St. Louis, a ragtag band of castaways, clothes crusted with salt from the sea air and faces burned by the whipping sand in the winds. As they collapsed into the safety of the colony, they swapped tails with the other survivors eventually asking if anyone from the raft had yet arrived. The raft which the men of the boats had so ruthlessly cast aside and so quickly forgotten. As the five boats pulled away from the raft and across the horizon, silence slowly began to fall over the men aboard as one by one each member realised just how dire their situation now was. After the disappearance of the boats, the consternation was extreme. All the terrors of thirst and famine arose before our imaginations, and we had besides to contend with a perfidious element which almost covered the half of our bodies. When recovered from their stupefaction, the sailors and soldiers gave themselves up to despair. All saw inevitable destruction before them and gave vent in lamentations to the gloomy thoughts which agitated them. The officers and senior members of the expedition aboard 
included the surgeon Henri Savigny, geographical engineer Alexandre Corriard, secretary to Schmaltz, Griffin de Ballet, and midshipman Coulian, who was by far the most experienced sailor, though he had been badly wounded in the leg during the anarchy of the evacuation. Deciding that leadership needed to be grasped and utilised if any chance of survival was to be had, Surgeon Henri Savigny took control of the raft and ordered a small mast and sail to be constructed. Drastically undersized and with no means to actually steer the barely floating platform, the small sail would at least allow them to move, even if it would be at the whim of the winds that whipped across the sandbanks. He then distributed the soggy biscuits, soaked in wine to disguise the taste of the seawater. The 25-pound sack split among 147 passengers made for a barely worthwhile ration, and once it was gone, the food aboard the raft was entirely depleted. As the men sat, turning over the mulch biscuit in their mouths, their minds wandered to fantasies of rage and revenge upon those that had cast them aside to save themselves. This burning hatred fueled an initial buoyant survival spirit amongst the raft dwellers, though perhaps, crushed on board a sinking makeshift raft, this was not the best set of emotions to dwell upon. The first night passed peacefully as the structure creaked and blew in the wind. By morning as the sun rose, twelve of their number had perished from their injuries sustained during the evacuation. Some had passed out from pain and slipped from the raft lost into the sea. The second day too passed without major incident, though three members committed suicide in despair, tossing themselves into the sea. Members who still held onto their faculties watched on with indifference as space slowly opened up and was at once swallowed by those around it. That night, strong winds blew and a storm hit the raft, blowing it to and fro, pitching and tilting in a manner that was dangerously close to capsizing it. In the crush of bodies that struggled to stumble from one side to the next in order to attempt to counterbalance the tilt, those underfoot were trampled indiscriminately. With the rising levels of despair and anger on board, a group of sailors decided to take it upon themselves to steal the remaining wine and get drunk. This quickly led to violence breaking out all across the raft, as the sailors began to tear at the structure, intending to smash it up and dash them all to sea. Those that attempted to stop them were drawn into the brawl, and before long, a full-scale riot had broken out. Swords and bayonets flashed beneath the night sky, as waves slapped up, washing across the precarious platform, and all around, bodies fell as blood seeped off the platform, dissipating into the surrounding ocean. People with no weapons chose to bite their foes, desperate to defend themselves. By morning, any survivors had eventually punched themselves out, and as exhaustion fell across the group, silence sprang up in place of the screams and moaning of the injured. Bodies lay piled up on the raft, Body parts floated and bobbed across the deck. The riot had brought about the death of a further 60 men, 45 of them brutally murdered, whilst another 15 were thought to have drowned in despair. Of the original 147 passengers, half had already perished just three days from the evacuation. Those that were left alive were surrounded by a grim scene of absolute carnage, as the intoxicating effects of the wine, the sunstroke, the starvation and the fevers from infection led to hallucinations and delirium. Mr. Corriard fancied he was travelling through the fine plains of Italy. One of the officers said to him gravely, I remember that we have been deserted by the boats, but fear nothing. I have just written to the governor and in a few hours we shall be saved. Mr. Corriard replied in the same tone and as if he had been in an ordinary situation, Have you a pigeon to carry your orders with as much celerity? All the while, the raft zigzagged south at the whim of the wind, while sharks, attracted by the blood that seeped from the raft, circled the sinking platform. Some attempted to catch them using improvised hooks and lines, but the instability of the vessel tangled their lines as it bobbed and twisted. The next day, the atmosphere aboard the ship had once again returned to quiet and those left made efforts to conserve their energy. Having had nothing to eat for four days, some took to eating the leather of their ammunition sacks or from the scabbards of swords. Others, more grimly, began looking at the piles of dead bodies 
and considered the flesh as a valuable resource. By the evening, the first members of the raft began cutting the limbs from the bodies, eating the flesh raw from the bones. Those whom death had spared in the disastrous night which we have just described fell upon the dead bodies with which the raft was covered and cut off pieces which some instantly devoured. Many did not touch them. Almost all the officers were of this number. Seeing that this horrid nourishment had given strength to those who had made use of it, it was proposed to dry it in order to render it a little less disgusting. In a rare spot of luck, Shortly after, a large school of flying fish passed the raft, with several jumping up onto the deck. They were quickly seized and stored in barrels, and afterwards a makeshift oven was constructed to cook the fish. Many members now took it upon themselves to partake in a human feast that lay on the decks of the raft, tearing strips from the bodies and cooking it, eating it together with the fish in an effort to disguise the taste. Realising that the bodies were a useful form of sustenance, more and more of them were cut into strips and hung from the ropes that held up the mast in order to dry the meat. The fourth night fell upon the raft, which now looked like a macabre scene of butchery. As many began to sleep, a second mutiny sprung from a group of soldiers. This time, with more space to move, it was quickly shut down, and by morning there were only 30 of the original 147 passengers left alive. Days passed, melding into one another, as the survivors baked under the tropical sun during the day and were cast into pitch-black darkness at night. By the seventh day of drifting, two soldiers attempted to steal the remaining wine, but were caught and promptly executed. Twenty-seven members now remained, half of which were slowly dying. A council was held amongst the remaining senior survivors, and it was decided that those who were too weak to survive should be tossed overboard in order to save the remaining rations of wine. Three members of the group walked around the survivors, judging them either fit to survive and left alone, or too weak, at which point they were pushed from the raft and left to drown in the sea. This shocking turn was later justified by Savigny in his reports of his time on the raft by blaming those that had put them in the situation in the first place. Three sailors and a soldier took on themselves this cruel execution. We turned our faces aside and wept tears of blood over the fate of these unhappy men. Readers who shudder at the cry of outraged humanity recollect, at least, that it was other men, fellow countrymen and comrades, who had placed us in this abominable situation. Of the fifteen members left alive after the brutal culling, it was decided that their weapons would be tossed overboard to ensure no more mutinies would take place and a concerted effort to survive as a group would be made. Using their remaining strength, they built a small shelter in the centre of the raft that afforded them some shade from the sun, which burned and cracked their skin, already rubbed raw from the crystallisation of the sea salt that ripped at the dry surface every time they moved. Sustenance remained in the form of dried human meat cut from the bodies of the dead, and after the wine was depleted, they took to drinking urine which they cooled by placing the containers in the sea and tied to the side of the raft. In his delusions, and with little else to ponder, Savigny took to considering the differences of each member's urine. Mr Savigny observed that the urine of some of us was far more agreeable than that of others. There was a passenger who could never prevail upon himself to swallow it. In reality, it had not a disagreeable taste, but in some of us it became thick and extraordinarily acrid, It produced an effect truly worthy of remark. On the tenth day of drifting, they were encircled by sharks, and whilst none managed to do any damage to the survivors, a school of jellyfish washed across the submerged deck, stinging them violently. Whilst the stings weren't a danger to their lives, they caused sickness and intense, agonising pain. Beginning to feel despair hanging heavy over the raft once more, the next day some suggested building a smaller raft, and attempting to row ashore. Summoning their strength once again, they built the boat along with a set of oars, but as soon as they sent one member aboard to test its seaworthiness, it quickly sunk. Three more days passed, as the men began to seriously consider taking their own lives. Unsure of where they had drifted, the Argus was spotted on the horizon. 
tying a string of material together and hanging it from the mast as a signal, they attempted to flag her down, but she soon disappeared over the horizon. Sinking back onto the deck, things began to feel very bleak indeed. Strips of human flesh hung all around them, drying in the sun, the bodies left aboard rotting and stinking. Hope was all but lost. From the delirium of joy, we fell into profound despondency and grief. We envied the fate of those whom we had seen perish at our side, and we said to ourselves, when we shall be destitute of everything and our strength begins to forsake us, we will wrap ourselves up as well as we can. We will lay ourselves down on this platform, the scene of so many sufferings, and there we will await death with resignation. At last, to calm our despair, we wished to seek some consolation in the arms of sleep. The day before we had been consumed by the fire of a burning sun. This day, to avoid the fierceness of his beams, we made a tent with the sails of the frigate. As soon as it was put up, we all lay down under it so that we could not perceive what was passing around us. We then proposed to inscribe upon a board an account of our adventures, to write all of our names at the bottom of the narrative and to fasten it to the upper part of the mast in the hope that it would reach the government and our families. Two hours later, as they drifted listlessly in the ocean, a wake broke out across the deck of the Ra. Turning their heads from the shelter, elation fell across them as the Argus drew up alongside the bizarre-looking raft of death. Those that I had rescued had fed themselves on human flesh for several days, and at the moment I found them, the ropes which held the mast were covered with morsels of this flesh which they had hung up to dry. It must have been a truly horrifying sight, but for those aboard the raft, they had little room to be ashamed. They collapsed aboard the Argus, which sailed back towards St. Louis. In their 14 days at sea, they had drifted 90 nautical miles south of the wreck of the Medusa. Of the 147 originally on board, 15 had survived. As they pulled into the Senegal port two days later, the survivors from the Medusa were finally reunited, those that had struggled and those that had escaped without a moment's thought and sailed to St. Louis in relative opulence. Both the Senegal boat and the captain's barge had made the journey to St. Louis without trouble, feasting on luxury provisions until they met up with another ship from the original convoy, the Echo, which they boarded and sailed the rest of the way in comfort. Once back in St. Louis, the survivors who needed treatment were bunked into the local English hospital, whilst those fit enough found families to stay with, either French or sympathetic English. 52 days after the wreck, the Medusa was found by a salvage vessel sent from the French port, and on board they found three survivors from the 17 that had been left behind. These men had survived by eating the rations left aboard the boat and were just barely alive. Were they not found, it was estimated that they would have died within days. As something of a catharsis, Henry Savigny began writing his report of the time he spent aboard the raft, and when he arrived home in France, it was quickly leaked to the French left-wing press who pounced on the story, creating a national embarrassment for the ultra-royalists in charge of the expedition. De Chaumere took it upon himself to blame the faulty charts given to him at the outset, but Savigny's account was damning. He was eventually court-martialed in Rochefort and tried on five counts. He was acquitted of abandoning his squadron, failing to refloat his ship and of abandoning the raft. However, he was found guilty of incompetent navigation and abandoning the Medusa. The verdict lessened the severity of the trial and though he still stood against the possibility of the death penalty, he was given just three years in prison. Of the 15 raft survivors, Five more died within five months of rescue so due, to health, due to health complications directly caused by their time on the raft. The horrors they endured were painted by Theodore Jericho in 1819 in a large oil painting that shows the scene of the moment when the Argus came into view over the horizon and the 15 survivors attempted to signal the ship to effect their rescue. It was first displayed under the title of Shipwreck Scene though everyone who saw it was instantly aware that it was a scene from the raft of the Medusa. It was both artistically and politically confrontational, and eventually purchased after Jericho's death in 1824 by the curator of the Louvre, where it still hangs today. 
The wreck of the Medusa was uncovered in 1980 and its artifacts put on display in Paris Marine Museum. Let the reader imagine 15 unfortunate men, almost naked, their bodies and faces disfigured by the scorching beams of the sun. Ten of the fifteen were hardly able to move. Our limbs were excoriated, our sufferings were deeply imprinted on our features, our eyes were hollow and almost wild, and our long beards rendered our appearance still more frightful. We were but the shadows of ourselves. Through how many terrible trials have we passed? Where are the men who can say that they have been more unfortunate than we? The Death Wrath, ladies and gentlemen, and it certainly lives up to its name. I don't know if it's going to be as horrifying for everyone else as it was for me. Say it might just have been my own personal kind of fears, but what a, what a terrifying ordeal. We're going to have a cheeky little bit of capitalism and then we'll be right back. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, we need to, you know, run a few ads. So by that end, we've become an official affiliate with Audible. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service where you pay a monthly fee and with that fee you get a credit that you can spend on an audiobook of your choice. It's actually quite a good service and I'm a member of it myself so I'm quite happy to have it as a kind of advert in Dark Histories despite the fact I don't really like adverts because I just think it's a, a good service that's a decent value for money. The basic deal with Audible is that you get a credit once a month that you can spend on an audiobook. And if you cancel, you keep all your books, which is quite nice. They don't take any of your stuff away. Um, you, I, I routinely start and stop my subscription when I, when I don't need to use it, basically. And all my books stay there. They have an app on iOS and Android and I do believe Windows as well. So you can always listen to it on any device and they all sync up as well, which is pretty handy. If this sounds at all interesting to you and you're interested in trying it out, then head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories and you can get a one month trial where you get a free audiobook of your choice. At the end of the trial, if you don't like it or you think it's not ready for you, you can cancel it and it'll, you can keep your free audiobook. And by using our affiliate link, we get a small kickback in the process, which helps to support the show. So it's win-win for everyone, really. So if you are interested, that link again is audible.com forward slash dark histories. Or if you prefer, go to darkhistories.com, check out support, and you'll find a link there that leads directly to the trial page. Thanks very much. Ads are a pain in the butt, right? Of course, you can hit that 30 second skip button, and that's all cool. But a much cooler way of skipping the ads is to sign up to the Dark Histories Patreon. You get a bunch of different benefits for doing so, including ad-free shows, access to early release episodes, the full back catalogue of bonus episodes, including the live stream archive and all the other bonus content. You get access to all my research notes for each episode, and you get the added bonus that you're actually a part of the show, helping to keep it independent and sustainable from as little as $1 a month. So if you think that might be something you might be interested in doing, hop over to darkhistories.com and you'll find the support page with all the details to get involved. Thanks very much for not skipping this and giving my hard sale a listen. Let's get back to the show. Welcome back. So the wreck of the Medusa, something I found really interesting about it was how, how little the English press um, spoke about it in 1818 like as it when it happened back then there was an awful lot of european news in the press especially french um there's a lot of sort of news about the french courts and things like that so i, I assumed that it, it you know then this would be sort of right in the newspapers quite a lot but yeah no there was almost none and uh, i was quite surprised by that uh, i found like a few stories but they're all like middle of the newspaper and just sort of kind of general um, nothing too sort of large, uh, just small stories. So I was quite surprised by that, that, that they didn't get a bit more involved because especially given that it's a sort of embarrassment for France, I would have thought the English press would have loved that. And, you know, that, that it involved the English as well, like the, the, the English um, obviously handing over St. Louis to France. But then I wondered if that was perhaps why 
perhaps they just didn't want to remind people that they were handing over St. Louis to the French. So they kind of kept it low key. I, I don't know. Maybe they just didn't think it was much of a story. But I, I, and it's just a, an aside, really, that I just found quite interesting. If you enjoyed the story, I, I ho- wholly recommend a book called The Wreck of the Medusa by Jonathan Miles. It, it's a really good book. I mean, honestly, I feel like I skimmed a lot of the grimness that was going on, um, especially the people that walked from the shore down the coast of Africa, basically. I, I sort of skimmed over there ordeal to a certain extent and but but he kind of goes more into it and 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 it's really good and not only that but the book is more so about the painting uh by jericho and it's really interesting it's really gives you a good sort of insight into the actual story that i've just told and the history around it as well with the painting and the the political situation so I, I definitely recommend that. I, I'll put it in the, it'll be in the sources anyway. Um, but yeah, Jonathan Miles, um, The Wreck of the Medusa, really, really good book. And I think also another one, if you w- w- like this story, is First Hand Accounts from Savigny and Corriard that was published in 1818. Again, I'll, I'll put that in the, um, in the sources, obviously, in the show notes, and, and you'll be able to see. Um, but I really recommend it. If you, if you use those two books, um, basically, Jonathan Miles' Wreck of the Medusa and Savigny's and Corriard's first-hand accounts, you'll cover like almost the entire story, basically. The only thing you're going to be missing is a few quotes here and there, you know, a few first-hand accounts. There, there is there's a couple of diaries that are also really interesting. And obviously the press reports, although they're, they're, there's not many, but, but yeah, just as a sort of follow-up, if you were, were interested in the story and you like the sound of it and you want to get more into it, I recommend those two. You could read those two and know more or less everything you need to know about it. So yeah, the, and, and I say that the, the book by Jonathan Miles was really, really, um, really interesting. It was really, it's a good page turner, if you like. Um, not a chore, not a chore to read at all. And the, the 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 whole information about the painting is is really fascinating as well. But yeah, that's pretty much that. It's not so much a mystery. I'm not really sure if there's much to talk about. Um, one thing that I just found interesting, I thought, was how initially all of the colonialists were the ones that were terrified of the barbaric Moors who were sort of, you know, known to be cannibals and all the rest of it. And it turns out that they were actually, you know, although they drove a hard bargain, they helped most people out. You, you know, like they traded hard, but they, 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 they worked as their tour guides and all the rest. And, and they actually turned out to be pretty decent whilst it was the French themselves that ended up as the cannibals. I thought that was interesting. I thought it was a nice kind of um, irony to the whole thing. But yeah, otherwise, I think that's kind of that. So I think we're going to move on because I say it's not really a, a mystery. So there's not too much to talk about, but I hope you enjoyed it. Say, so I, I, I wanted to go, I thought we'd been not light because Dark Issues is never really light, but I thought we needed a bit more of a scary story. And I thought this was pretty scary. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I say I found the whole thing terrifying. I don't know if that's just me being like the idea of being trapped on a raft in the middle of the ocean that is almost sinking, surrounded by sharks at night, that dark sea below you. Oh my. And oh no, that by itself is making me curl my toes now. It's just a horrible thought. And then you add in everything else, the drying human flesh hanging from the masts and drinking your own piss and eating dead bodies. It, wow, it's a real horror show. <laughs> so yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I, I say I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, but yeah, um, we'll be having a, a live stream. I'm not sure what that will be about. I, I mean, I guess it'll be about this story and we'll talk about it a little bit, but I should imagine we'll probably go off topic pretty quick but yeah that'll be next saturday on youtube if you want to come along um follow our social media all the information will be there um otherwise that's about all i've got to say if you'd like to find us on social media we're on twitter facebook instagram we've got our own discord channel if you want to come on that basically go to darkhistories.com all the information's there if you want to contact me you can do so contact at darkhistories.com is the email address or again, just go to darkhistories.com and you'll find links there. 
And you'll also be able to find ways to support the show, which is always gratefully received. So yeah, thanks very much. I, I'm going to leave that there this week. I will see you either at the live stream next Saturday or in two weeks time for a fresh episode where I say I think we're probably going to be getting pretty creepy from here on outwards uh, for a while at least because we're coming up to October and why not right so yeah thanks very much for listening hope you all have a great couple of weeks stay happy stay healthy I'll see you all very soon sleep tight